Welcome to this input on intelligent questions in learning. And of course, we have to start with the first question, which is why do we ask questions? Why are our school books full of questions? And it doesn't matter what the subject is, why do we have so many questions? When we answer that, relatively briefly, I hope, then we'll look at examples of intelligent questions that you can use in your classroom to make your learners more intelligent. Okay, so we'll ask the question and then go to the answer. Why do we ask questions? We ask questions because questions require answers. And that's the key reason. And when we ask those questions, we are asking our learners to notice something. We are directing their attention to a particular thing which we want them to think about. And questions are extremely useful for that. So when we ask questions, we are doing a great job of focusing our learners' intelligence on things we want them to think about. Also, when our learners know about questions, know how to ask them, know how to think with questions, well, then they can use them. And when they use them, they become more intelligent learners. So let's take a look at some of the most frequent questions and why they don't work. In a class of younger learners, the teacher will often ask, what's this, what's that? And that's it, that's it. In what's this or what's that, we have one piece of grammar and we have one question type and it's about the identity. Not very challenging, not requiring learners to process anything more than the name of the thing that is being looked at. We can do much better than that, and we will when we've moved a little bit further into this little talk on questions. Another favorite for teachers is, do you understand? And it's delightful because it's not a question. Most often it's nowhere near a question. It's a teacher's way of saying, okay, I've done that and you need to go, mm. <laughs> because we know that if you ask a group of learners, do you understand? No one wants to say, I don't understand. Everyone, everyone wants to go mm, and then get on with the next part. So we need to remember that when we phrase questions for our learners, these are opportunities to deepen thought process, to really engage thinking, and then of course, demonstrate much greater richness in the language that we're using in the variety of question types, and also much greater richness in the kind of language they produce in response. One of the classic ways we have of stopping our learners doing a lot with language and one of the classic ways we've got of stopping the thought process is by making a comment that signals that it's all over. So good job, well done, great idea, marvelous, etc. means that's the end. But why should it be the end? Why should the teacher not say Interesting. Can you tell me more about that? Hmm. Okay, explain that a little bit more to me so that when the teacher does that, it's clear that the teacher wants to know more, expects the learner to know more, and in that interaction is driving the quality of language upwards. These are some fine examples of what we really want to happen in the classroom. The question is, what questions can you ask to enable any of these four things to happen? What I want to do is give you an opportunity now to think about the questions that you could ask and pause the video while you do that. And then after you've done that, I'll see you on the next slide.
So a learner says something and you're not really sure what they mean, or you think they're not really sure what they mean. And you want to take this opportunity to give them a model and check with them if the model is a good description to help them monitor and improve their thought process. So you say to them, hmm, I'm not sure. Is this what you wanted to say? And then you go blah, 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 blah. And then the learner at that point gets the opportunity to code or remember that this is in fact the right way to ask that question or make that statement. So rather than correcting them or um, looking like that you're pretending that you know what they mean, you ask a question to help them monitor and reformulate their language. Second thing you might want to look at is um, if a learner says something in the classroom and you figure that you need to add more to it because they've said something that's very, very brief. You want to demonstrate to them that um, it's okay to be brief, but it's better to express more, to explain more. So you simply say to them, oh, okay, can I add more to what you have said? Yeah. And in doing that, you're getting their permission, of course, which puts them in an empowered position. And then you're also giving them what they want, which is a little bit more of what they wanted to say in the first place. Imagine also you're in the classroom and you've set a task, but you're not sure that they have fully understood what the task is. So you could repeat it. Yeah. Absolutely, you could repeat it loudly, yeah? Or you could ask questions to make sure that the learners knew what the focus of the activity was. So you could say to one of them, for example, do you need to explain this to your partner or do you need to find what you can agree on? Yeah, good question to clarify what the focus of the class is. And then you might say, after you've done that, you've got an answer from one of them. Then you say, Mary, do you agree with what Peter said just now? So that could be a nice, simple, but question-oriented way of checking your instructions. Another thing, of course, which is very important is summarize. Summarizing a, a text or something that has been learned, you can just say summarize. Or you can do something more exciting than that. You could say, Mary, could you tell Peter a short story of what you have learned? It's a much more engaged and question driven way of getting them to do what you want them to do in the classroom. If you want to be a really kind or other kind of lazy teacher, what you can do is just talk. In your lesson, talk for 45 minutes or more. And you talk and talk and talk, and slowly but surely your learners stop listening, and slowly but surely they stop learning. Now, it's tempting for us as teachers to do the talking, a little bit like me at the moment, but it really doesn't do very much in terms of making our learners think or helping them develop their language skills. So what can you do instead of that? What you can do is, for example, you've set a task, Tony has given an answer, and then you say to the students, is there anyone who can say what Tony has said but in another way. The message you're giving them is you want them to listen to what Tony has said to you and be part of a conversation that is slowly developing into one for the whole class. You could then say, does anyone want to add anything to what Tony has said? Does anyone want to ask Mary a question about what she has said? Does anyone want to comment on what Mary has said or the question that Mary has asked and so on. So what you're doing is you're creating within the whole class an opportunity for a shared communication, a lot of rich ideas and clearly a development and language competence.
you will recall from other parts of the course the importance of WH questions like who, what, when, where, why, how. The reason that you are asking those and you will recall is so that you're clarifying the context. And of course, we know that the context creates the meaning. So when you do that, you're giving your learners an opportunity to not only think in the language, but also have a greater awareness of the meaning of the items within the context. So there's an important thing to do. And then of course, you ask simple questions like where can you find and so on when you're clarifying Lexus. But then what you don't do is leave it there. Once you've asked a question like that, then you get learners to ask one another. They're exploring meaning and they're deepening their awareness of language. You can demonstrate different question types by asking questions like, is this a blah, 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 or a blah, blah, blah. You're demonstrating it. You're also giving a supported question because you're giving them little hints as to what the options are. A nice approach to take when you want to support your learners a little bit more. You can ask questions that ask them to think about the categories of language. So you can say, for example, an elephant is a kind of and wait, and then they come back and say animal. You say tea is a kind of, and then they come back and they say drink. So you're not only looking at language there, you're also looking at the relationship within language that words and their superordinates have, if you like. Another thing that you can look at is just using um, questions to help you review what the learners have done in the past. So you can ask questions like, when was the last time we heard that? Or do you remember a class when we did this before? So all of those little questions help learners process and increase their skills in language use. Sometimes asking the right questions is just about being in the habit of asking the right questions. So it's good to review what some of our standard options are. So when we get an answer from a learner, we can say, um, how do you know that? Or why do you think that? And that's pretty important. We can ask questions um, in relation to vocabulary, like what context can you find that in? Because we know the importance of context for creating meaning. That's also a very good way of checking that the learner has got the right meaning of a particular item of Lexus. You might also think about what time or place you can say a particular thing in so they're further aware of the context. You can also think um, about extending the language and extending the meaning, perhaps making it more fun, more exciting by asking questions like, what can you do with that? So some, fair, some fairly simple questions there that we can use as part of our repertoire of keeping our classes intelligently engaged with their learning. We know that we will spend a lot of good time in class asking questions and getting our learners to ask and answer with one another. And we know that in that we're driving their language acquisition. We also know that learning vocabulary is very, very important for that. But learning vocabulary is what? Is it just a matter of looking at the list and trying to remember it? Or is it about using it in some way? And so when we go to our VQL or our vocabulary question list, we are in fact using the language. So we have the learners with one another with their own vocabulary question lists and they start asking the questions. And it could be any of the questions that we've got listed here. It could be something like, um, I say it, you find it. So one person says, bookcase and the other one has to look through the list and find it, or look through the book and find it. It could be as something as simple as, um, please show me. 
So they look through the list and they show you something that you want. It might have been blue. Please show me blue. So someone looks through the list and finds the word blue. Um, it could be something like I point to it, you say it. So I could point to a word like, for example, board, and then the other, my partner would need to say board. I could make it more interesting depending on our level and how much time we we've got it could be something like please draw la 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 there's more here but i think you get the idea that um, learners to develop their skills and vocabulary really need to do simple things like either ask questions or give one another instructions that require answers in relation to lexis lists Obviously, the freer the use of language in the questions, the better. So if um, we have one learner who says to the other, ask me a WH question about this word, well, then that's great. Because what we're getting there, hopefully with a bit of monitoring from you, is monitoring of the question types that go with all the WH questions. So lots and lots of really good language that can come from that simple instruction. After that, of course, um, you want to make sure that your learners are also developing grammatical awareness. So you'll be asking things like, or they will be asking things like, is this a noun or a thing? Is it a verb, an action word or a doing word and so on? So you're asking them to look at words, not necessarily with the little bracket hints beside them, but looking at words in order to become more aware of their, their grammar. Another lovely little thing you can do, kids really enjoy it and older learners enjoy it as well, is one person selecting four words, the other person using those four to make a story. It's a really nice way to both check meaning and also engage active use of the language. You will be aware of the benefit of these questions, like what is opposite, what's similar, please explain because this kind of question or instruction is really useful for checking the meaning of questions when learners are answering them in the classroom. It's a really good way of getting them to extend the possible vocabulary that is being referenced in, for example, a listening test or a reading test. So when they're checking the questions and they're looking for what is similar, they're looking for synonyms and other words that could have the same meaning, which is being tested in a particular exam. Or what is an opposite is also a really good way of testing a question and also testing words within a text that are being used in a test. Please explain is a really nice open way of dealing with Lexis. So these three questions can be applied to any number of lists, but certainly lovely little questions for learners to use with one another to extend their awareness of Lexis. Of course, we can't forget the importance of questions in relation to spelling. If learners are asking one another questions in relation to spelling, then they're going to improve their language as well as improving their spelling skills. And we want that awareness so that when they're developing um, their reading skills through the early phonics program, well then, at that time, if they're asking and answering about spelling, then you're getting a really nice development of the awareness of sound and letters and how they go together. So you can have lots of questions like how many letters are there? What's the middle letter or the middle letters? How do you spell it backwards? And of course, in all of those, you're asking the learner or they're asking one another to think about each of the letters to count them and especially with how do you spell it backwards there's a lot of processing associated with that 
you can do questions like how many syllables does it have? And that's a really, really nice thing to do. And also questions like, are there any parts of the word which you have seen before? So all of those are really nice, clear, focused questions for improving spelling skills. As you get further into language learning, obviously, the range of vocab increases and also the importance of knowing the forms that create nouns, verbs, adjectives and so on. And so you want your learners to be thinking when they're looking at words if they have any other forms. So a word like feel, for example, what other forms can you have with that? So there's feel, there's feeling, there's felt, um, and you know there's there are obviously verbs and nouns and so on. So you want your learners to be asking one another questions about what other parts of speech a particular word has. You want them also to challenge one another to define it. You want to do this at a higher level rather than a lower level because defining a word is actually very difficult. You want them also to be aware of things like prefixes and suffixes and how the prefix will help them with the meaning and the suffix will help them with the grammar. So those are important questions to add. And as always, um, because we're language learners, there's a need to check PRON and check spelling. And it's certainly no um, bad thing if you have difficulty in pronouncing new words, because sometimes you absolutely have no idea how to pronounce them um, unless you look them up in a dictionary. And I don't mean um, if you're learning English, I mean even if you are an English speaker, you would have to look them up. So that's it for the moment in terms of um, questions that we're going to ask in relation to vocabulary. But just one more final point to make. I am sure you know the final point already. And that final point is that when we are developing questioning techniques, the main objective is that we want our learners to start using those techniques with one another. If you're a good teacher, you're modeling good question types, you have transferred them to one another, so they're using them with one another, then they become more capable. They will make your life a little bit more difficult because they will ask you more complex questions, but then there's nothing to worry about in that because good teachers always want to be challenged in their learning. They always want to be asked questions. <laughs>